as an immigrant to this country, I came here uh, believing that this is the country for the better life. And yet now, if you look at the statistics, America is number 10th in upward mobility behind uh, Sweden and Finland and Germany and France. So these countries are now doing the American dream better than we are doing it. Maybe we should sue them for a copyright violation. <laughs> or maybe we should recognize that the anger that has been unleashed around the country has um, legitimate roots in how broken the system is, that it has allowed what has happened to the middle class to happen. We have a choice to tap into our better angels and recognize that even though we talk constantly about shortages, shortages of jobs, shortages of revenues, we also have an overabundance of skills, of energy, of creativity, of the power to innovate and of time that are going underused. And the thing that has most stunned me that I'm chronicling in this section is the amount of resilience and creativity across the country. It seems to me that the transition to a pure service economy where we, we, we produce ideas and, and services, as many of the examples of the people you cited really are in the idea of producing business, is, uh, is the future of this country. And we are a dynamic country. We're built for change. And, uh, and, and that's the way forward. I'm more, and I don't think it's because uh, we've lost our way and lost our values as America. I don't, okay. buy, I don't buy that at all. I do think, though, we're in the midst of a huge sea change that happens you know, oftentimes once every century um, that's causing just big dislocation, that not unlike when we went into an industrialized world, we are now moving from this mass production model to a sort of customized production model. That's not at all what I'm talking about. I think that there are structural imbalances that need to be corrected. And I think when you talk about a crisis of values, there's no question that there is a crisis of values at the heart of it as well. Uh, there is a, the fact that so many people thought that there was a shortcut to the American dream, that there was a kind of no down payment, mm -hmm. no proof of income, ticket to the good life, is not what this country was built on. A company called TPK in China, uh, it was a 200 person company in 2007. They won the award for the Apple iPhone touchscreen materials. It is now 200,000 employees three years later. <laughs> um, so there it's an example of just as much as we can do to incentivize um, innovation and other things within this country, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting, going to get any closer to full employment. In many ways, we're actually improving the lives of all these others in other countries. I think the key problem um, which the African continent has suffered from and continues to suffer from is that um, there the fact that the capital coming in, the money coming in in the form of aid, um, creates um, or, or cuts the link between the individual and the government. So in other words, when you live in the United States, the deal with the government is that they will tax you and in return the government will provide you a suite of public goods, which are education, infrastructure, healthcare, and national security. In Africa, those goods are provided by the international community. And therefore, um, Africans on the ground are unable to hold their governments to account. Now, you might be saying to yourselves, what the heck does that mean, or what does that relate, how does that relate to innovation? Well, you have a society where the government has no vested interest in job creation or building industries or companies um, because they know that the suites of public goods will actually be provided by outsiders. 